you are trained as a technician to push the agenda of pharmaceutical companies. And the reason I say that, and, and I'm not being conspiratorial, but Temple University is where I went to medical school. They built a multi-million dollar building in a, and, and displaced about a hundred black families in North Philadelphia to build this building. And who paid for that building? It was largely pharmaceutical companies. So of course the curriculum is also going to inc include not a lot of nutritional insights or a functional lab workup for the thyroid. It's gonna really be hellbent on you learning how to use about 500 different medications, understanding how they work in the body, what, what they're comprised of, what the counter counteractions are, or the interactions are with other drugs. Like So when you arrive then on the scene of a birth and you're trained to do pharmaceuticals, or if you're a surgeon like an OBGYN, you're trained to do surgery, this whole like get out of the way, don't use those skills notion is really, really hard. And of course, when you start Im implementing any interventions and you disrupt the, the life cycle of birth, I'm gonna have other things I have to contend with. So Nathan Riley, a uh, big, big, big welcome to the Your Body's Way podcast. It's so Thank great you. to have you here. And um, it, it really is, um, you're actually a very unique guest on this podcast because I've never spoken to someone um, as of yet who has your sort of background. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, you're a home birth doctor, a uh, holistic yeah. gynecologist and um not just that but you also coach your you know your clients and also the people who study with you um functional medicine background lifestyle coaching nutrition you have podcasts and programs and so you, <laughs> you do a lot you do a lot um okay. so how, how are things over there so you're in kentucky how are things well you know what might surprise people is nobody really dreams of moving to a place like Kentucky, but unlike where most of the food in the United States is actually coming from, we're surrounded by micro farms and raw dairy and, you know, grass fed, like truly regeneratively raised owls and other animals. So it's hard for us to argue leaving here, given the low cost of living, but it also allows me um, total flexibility and what I'm able to do. And with biodynamic farms right down the street and farmers markets and CSAs and like literally anything we could want from a, from a raising a healthy family standpoint, um, this is, this is where I think people should live, right? You, you, you can throw a handful of, of any sort of vegetable seeds in the ground here and it comes up in a matter of weeks. Like it's, it's a really, really nice place to live, given um, how important and and what a high priority it is in our family to be eating nutritional food. So I, you know, um, I don't even want to tell people how low my mortgage rate is, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you just a little snippet. We've got a super low interest rate and we have a four bedroom house for about a fifth the price you would pay in L.A. So um all of that being said, there are limitations. There's a lot of political kind of strife here where it's mostly a red state and the cities are blue. And I somehow kind of fall in the purple now ever since the Schmovid stuff. And, um, but as far as raising kids and getting them outside to parks and having walkable neighborhoods, um, we have a really, really, um, dare I say, blessed life. It's a, it's a really nice place to live. It sounds lovely. That kind of brings me to what I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. And that is, you used to work in a hospital. And you know, that's where you came from. That's your background. But yeah. when COVID started, that's when things started to shift for you. Um, right. And that's when you exited the, the system, the medical system. So right. what I wanted to um, get started with is for anybody who doesn't know of you, I'm sure anybody who's listening, um, they do know about you and they <laughs> probably listened to um, your points of view on, on birth yeah. and the medical system. But can you just explain, um, like, what is your story? Why did you become so passionate about home birthing and, um, you know, freedom of choice and, um, how did that happen? And how did you get out of the medical system? Yeah, I'll give you a different answer than what I usually give, which I think a lot of people think I was just super disgruntled. And I was like, burn the system down, screw the man. And, and there's an element of that, of course, I, I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't have a little bit of that in me, which I got from my father and my mother 
sort of encouraging me to stand up for what I thought was right. Um, I kind of became a pain in the ass, honestly, uh, in, in my medical training, getting called to the principal's office at least a dozen times between medical school and, and my residency training program. Um, but really, you know, I, I think seeing a natural birth in the, under the care of a midwife, for example, early in training was helpful. Going to home births with Stu Fishbein about halfway through residency and seeing that this can be done in different ways, that was helpful working with so many midwives outside of the hospital, even after my post-grad training was really helpful. But most importantly, I actually do think since you brought up the Shmovid stuff, I actually think that everything that was wrong with the medical system became clear to me. And I was sort of left without any choice. And from a birth standpoint, and, and the things I'm talking about are that if I'm going to do things the way that I think needs to be done in order for the person I'm here to care for, to feel seen, witnessed at the center of the conversation, I have to break a lot of rules. And oftentimes there's punitive measures towards doctors who don't want to go along with the program. That's just the way it is in the United States and probably many places in the world. Um, but most importantly, from a pregnancy standpoint, let's start with the preconception phase. You, you go to your doctor and you say, we've been having sex for 12 months and we're, you know, we're 31 and 30 we're not having a baby. And the OBGYN says, let's get some, a, a lab panel, let's get an ultrasound. And if everything looks normal there, they're going to send you to what we call the reproductive endocrinologist. That's this fertility specialist. They used to call the, themselves the infertility specialist, but people don't like that term. And it's probably not true anyways. There's probably very, very few people who are truly infertile, but you go to the, the fertility specialist, they run a basic semen analysis, maybe a couple of extra labs. They get something uh, like an x-ray with some dye shot up into the uterus to see that the tubes are open. And if all of that looks good, we start pumping you full of artificial, uh, they're not really hormones, but they're chemicals that act like hormones. We compel the body to you know, force it to get pregnant. And then you have a pregnancy that is now naturally high risk because nobody looked upstream to figure out what was wrong. And I saw this happening, like shuttling men and women in, they get really, really down in the dumps about their fertility journey. And they naturally find themselves getting shot up with all these hormones and chemicals. Their relationship is kind of on the rocks because this has become so mechanical yeah. and less, less inspiring, you know, yeah. than conceiving a baby through this divine union of the masculine and feminine. And I can go down that path for hours if you'd like, but, but the problem I had was nobody's looking upstream. Like, why is nobody talking about the thyroid? Why are we only looking mm -hmm. at the TSH? Why are we... Um, looking at hemoglobin as merely a reflection of iron status, as opposed to a variety of other things that can lead to malabsorption of nutrients and and all this other stuff. So, in the pregnancy phase, it was it was actually even worse. And what I love to do is to really help a person do what they can, given their resources, their willingness, wherever they want to focus. If they want to prevent these pregnancy complications that are causing a rise in our C-section rates and induction rates and this discord between their them and their doctor or their them and their midwife risking them out of midwife many, you know many mm -hmm. times things like preeclampsia and gestational diabetes why don't we start helping them prevent that and a lot of people in the states have plenty of resources to do this but their mm -hmm. doctor's not telling them anything mm -hmm. the same goes for the pap smear and the hpv thing that leads to cervical cancer fortunately it's very rare but like we're not giving people any tools we're just saying come in for a repeat biopsy on, on one of your sexual organs your cervix and then maybe we'll just lock the cervix off so basically all of this the entire experience of what i was trained to do as an obgyn i had to draw into question because it reduced this down to a medical procedure or a some sort of pathology and nobody was mm -hmm. ever talking about preventing it in the first place so i had to go elsewhere to find that and now that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. it, John, it's, it's so interesting because I, before this podcast, I had to do a bit more um, diving into the topic than I usually would because I had sure. no idea that there was so much. Um, is Would you say there's a divide between holistic birth and um, the typical medical system, like the way a baby is born in the medical system? Is there a divide? Because that's that's the sense that yeah. I get. Um I mean, I was looking up some some stats. So I looked at the UK because I knew that, you know, you you would know the US, but you probably know mm. the UK as well. But you advocate for 85% um, home births. But then I looked at the UK stats just out of curiosity and only 2% do it at home. 
same and, same states right yeah. and yeah. the thing is like I so I've had two children um, both of them in hospital and they were fine like I wouldn't say they were great births they were just fine like I survived yeah. I got through it yeah. Um, yeah but I have to say like you know I did know a little bit about home births but I felt um I felt quite afraid of it and I felt like well surely there's a higher risk of something going wrong surely there's a higher risk of you know they, they say hospital birth equals safe birth and people right. think you're more likely to die if you're at home you know right. and right. and I I kind of fell into that category so I mean what would you say to people who feel that who think that a home birth is just too scary and surely there's more likely likelihood of something to go wrong Oh gosh, there's a lot there. Well, let's mm -hmm. use the word holistic. So let's unpack that. A lot of people use holistic and natural interchangeably. And I want to go a little bit further than that. I want to describe what who is Tamara. Tamara is not just a walking meat suit filled with mm -hmm. labs, you know, blood that's reflected in labs and and uh, lungs that are reflected on x-ray. Like there's something about the birth experience that is not measurable, right? So when we so when I say holistic, what I and that's the name of my my company is Beloved Holistics. When I say holistic, what I mean is that if we're only looking at the physical and our only metric is that you and your baby are likely to survive, that's a pretty low bar for me to hit because mm -hmm. the likelihood of you or your baby dying is already absolutely low. But what happens when we start intervening in this process? Do we start to uh, potentially shift this the risk of something bad happening to Tamara or anybody as a consequence of us interrupting the process. And we can look at this from a neurochemistry standpoint. We can look at this on the physical standpoint, you know, the risk of future, future pregnancies of an un unnecessary primary C-section, meaning in your first birth, you get a C-section. It opens you up to a, a plethora of other risks in your future pregnancies. But more importantly, there are a lot of women who have vaginal births and they say something just didn't feel right. In fact, there was almost... A, a traumatic experience in the hospital, which advertises safety as a consequence of how we treat pregnancy, which mm -hmm. is as a disease and how we treat birth, which is seen as a medical procedure. So it begs, a, it begs the question, is it truly safe in the hospital? Mm -hmm. If we consider safety to be beyond just the likelihood of you or your baby dying. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, no, there's not a lot of safety in hospitals because it is so mechanized that you you haven't personalized this person's care. You walk in and you sort of say, here's how things are going to go. And even that alone can be really, really hard for a lot of families. So in my practice, I found I was so tired that I didn't want to be doing the vaginal exams and everything. And I just stopped doing them. Another reason I was called to the principal's office, but then my outcomes were getting better. So you can't fire a resident or get that mad at me if my outcomes are good. So why is it that I'm compelled to do these things? Well, we have a way of doing things here. Who is compelling those ways of doing things? It's a C-suite, it's administrators, it's executives, it's the CEO, it's whoever, but it's not the doctor who spent $500,000 on his medical training. Mm -hmm. So if you're here to be helped and I just put you into a box and do it this way, could I be harming you? Not on the physical level necessarily, but could I be harming you on the emotional, the mental, the spiritual level? Could you be? Could I grow a distrust between you and the healthcare system, which is all kind of a wound in and of itself, because now you're going to be apprehensive about going back to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when we intervene, we do have worse outcomes, you know, as my sort of self-experimentation kind of demonstrated. So when I'm rupturing your waters, when I'm pushing the baby too hard through artificial oxytocin, not real oxytocin that comes from the brain, but oxytocin in a bag called pitocin in the United States, am I actually causing harm? And the truth is, since we're talking about home birth compared to hospital birth, which I think is the, that's the dichotomy for me, or out of hospital birth versus in hospital birth, those NICUs in the hospitals are probably 50% filled with preterm babies. And mm -hmm. those preterm babies may have not been preterm had we looked upstream from the moment that you tried to start getting pregnant. So of the other 50% of the beds in the NICU, that's the neonatal intensive care unit, we're not seeing a bunch of babies that crunked on a home birth midwife. We're looking at babies that would have otherwise been fine, but we pushed your, you and your body too hard that we led to some distress. And that baby then ended up needing extra support afterwards. 
So the whole point here of the holistic conversation is you as a birthing woman, a birthing family are far more than just the measurable aspects from imaging to lab work to everything else. And I actually bring the same criticism to the functional practitioners. Mm -hmm. This person is more than just what you see in their labs. There's more to this. So we have to have conversation. We have to get into dialogue. We have to build a relationship. And then only then can I start to rally your healthcare resources around you and where you feel most comfortable having your baby, which mm -hmm. could be in the hospital. That's totally fine. But we have to change the whole thing because women are not really being given an option. They're basically mm -hmm. saying what you said. Yeah. My birth was okay, it was okay, but what if your birth was extraordinary? Yeah. There's yeah. actually healing there. So we're not only not doing that detriment, we're actually providing you some healing through the birth itself. So that's yeah. Yeah. what I do. <laughs> and do you know what? Listening to you speak, it, it opens up a whole new world because a lot of women don't even know this exists. So okay. I, I entered the system just not knowing that there was anything else. And I went in there feeling like, um, you know, they, I, I basically handed myself over, which I think a lot of women do. And, um, you know, that, that to me felt like the only option. Whereas what, when you're speaking about what you're, what you do, um, it opens up a whole new world to women and it's like, oh, so there's an alternative there. Out of curiosity, what kind of people actually do come to you? Are they people who, um, they have an interest in holistic health and they found out about you or are they people who had a traumatic birth and they're like, I need a different experience. I think most of the people coming my way are people who have felt like something was hidden from them through their mm. whole process of being in the hospital. Most women, and we're speaking directly to women, but the male and the female that are a part of this are mm. both a part of the equation. And of course, I'm only talking about the, the typical heterosexual relationship. So we have even more complexity when we consider homosexual couples that are trying to get pregnant and everything else. But just looking at the male and female dyad, um, I think that what they feel is something wasn't shared with me. There, I, they, somebody wasn't being completely transparent. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of not having all of the information, let's just look at informed consent, pros, cons, alternatives to an intervention or not doing an intervention. That's what informed consent is. That's not practiced well in anywhere in West, in Western medicine. But um, when a person feels like you didn't tell me all of that, it immediately, you know, it, it plants a seed of distrust. Mm -hmm. And in the way that I speak, and the only ways in I can really speak like this without worrying about my livelihood is I'm not associated with any insurance companies, meaning I don't have any contracts with them to, to do certain things to get paid by them. I do all out of pocket. And um, I have no administrators or hospital system that has me sign a contract that says I can or can't do something. And that might just be how I was raised. Like, I just don't really care what somebody says is right or wrong. If it's not right for the, the, the client, and I say, don't say patient, because I don't take care of a lot of sick people. If it's not right for the client, then I'm not going to do it. I, I really don't care what the legislators or what the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists says. These are all guidelines. And I'm, the, I don't really think I'm an expert in anything, but if I'm the expert, then let me do what experts do. You know, mm -hmm. let me take care of people. So I think people really, uh, ever since the Schmovid stuff, I think they really feel like uh, some, some degree of distrust that the three and four letter organizations, particularly here in the United States, are not always out to, um, to do what's right for the people. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean COVID vaccines or not vaccines that either camp is right or wrong. It's just, I want to have the information and I want somebody to support me in making my own decisions. Mm -hmm. Understanding, and this is a big part of my teaching, is that if you want to be truly free in life, you have to also accept the outcomes of your decisions. But there's some real power in that. And it makes you be a little bit more discerning as to what you put into your body and, and how you show up in the world whenever you have to also own the outcome of that decision and you can't point fingers and blame somebody else. The people that like to blame other people are not the people who come to me. It's the people that really realize how much power they have whenever they start yeah. standing up on two feet. Yeah. So speaking of trauma, you brought that up. And I saw that 20% of women can experience post-birth trauma. Would you mm. agree with that? Does that sound about right to you? Oh, I think that's, I think that's way too low. But I think a, a, a part of the reason that you're not seeing it reflected in the data is that it's hard to measure trauma. Hard to measure because the, the trauma can happen later on. 
right like it can happen years later when you're just like something's wrong with me like you can't yeah you may that. not even know you may yeah. not even realize how how hurt you are mm. and you don't blame the doctors and the staff at the hospital or the midwife at home like it can happen in any direction right. you don't want to blame somebody else because of what we just described yeah. and yet there's something gnawing at you about how your birth went and it might not be four you know four or five years later maybe you take like I don't know, you go on like a mushroom journey or something and something comes up and you're like, holy shit. I mean, think about how we suppress childhood molestation right. And, right. and and past sexual abuse and all of that. Mm -hmm. As adults, we suppress that because it's sometimes a little bit too hard. It's too yeah. confronting. So when the literature tries to, to, to elaborate on trauma, we have a hard time defining trauma, which is mm -hmm. very simply unintegrated stress can result in trauma meaning a very, very subtle thing, even though you had that natural birth, healthy mom, healthy baby, baby, there could be something there that still doesn't feel right that is giving you apprehension about going back into a hospital. Right. That was because you were traumatized. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're a weak person or that you're lesser than. It just means there's something there and let's unpack that. And that's how where I think birth storytelling can actually be very, very helpful. So um, I think that number yeah. is probably an underestimate. Yeah, um, I have a couple of friends actually and my sister-in-law who had a traumatic birth so she basically got some pains and she was early it was her first child as well and she got some pain so she went to the hospital just to have it checked out like what's happening and they said oh, okay so we'll give you a sweep so they gave her a sweep and then nothing happened but she was still having pains and they were getting worse so they were like, okay, we're going to keep you in the hospital. So they kept her and she was kept for three days, basically. And they kept, they swept her, I think twice, like twice, maybe three times just to, and basically what they, what she came to conclusion of at the end was I wasn't ready for a sweep. Like the baby wasn't ready to come out. Like I wasn't ready to go into labor, but basically because they'd intervened, too soon she just ended up in this weird limbo like before giving birth and she was basically in labor for three days and I have another friend who um, was also in labor for three days funnily enough and for her it was more the sense of um, you know the, the, the nurses were a bit disrespectful one of them kissed their teeth at her and like it was just it was more the personal level that she had um, an issue with because the nurses they're there for hours they're there overnight like they're tired they're exhausted and you can't get the best out of them either. So I think having, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have great births in hospitals, but I think, like you said, you're more likely to have a traumatic experience in a hospital because um, they're not looking after you as a person. They're just looking out yeah. for themselves in a way, like even though the nurses, like I'm sure they're lovely, lovely people. But even when I gave birth to my first, the nurse, she was so lovely she um she was so friendly and she was just a lovely person to have around but then as the hours crept on and it got to early morning hours like I could see she was getting tired and she was getting very short and she was like angry and you know she was kind of not talking as much and I could just see she was upset so I mean it's how often do you see that people going into this um, cascade of intervention and then suddenly you need an intervention to cover up the intervention to cover up the intervention? I mean, is, was that your experience and that was why you were so upset with your experience in a hospital? Yeah, I mean, we have to bear in mind just how tired people are. Yeah, right. In hospitals, yeah. the labor and delivery nurses are up all night. They don't even have a relationship with you. They're not like a mm. midwife who's known you for hours at a time. 10 visits during your pregnancy, they're there to do a job. Mm. And doctors are trained to do a job too. You know, we come out of medical school where we're, 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 it's advertised like the way that Navy advertises people who want to be real tough with guns. Mm. The uh, medical schools advertise it as if you're the cream of the crop academically. And in some ways you are, if we're only looking at test scores, you know, like you must have been pretty bright in high school and college and all of that. But then you get into this thing that costs so much money medical school in the United States, it's, it's like, you're, you're, you're hell bent on getting those bills paid down. I have like $487,000 in medical school debt. And you're trained at the end of that to do one thing, which is, I'm not being, and this is not an embellishment. You are trained as a technician to push 
the agenda of pharmaceutical companies. And the reason I say that, and, and I'm not being conspiratorial, but Temple University is where I went to medical school. They built a multi-million dollar building in a, in, in displaced about a hundred black families in North Philadelphia to build this building. And who paid for that building? It was largely pharmaceutical companies. So of course the curriculum is also going to inc include not a lot of nutritional insights or a functional lab workup for the thyroid. It's gonna really be hell bent on you learning how to use about 500 different medications, understanding how they work in the body body, what, what they're comprised of, what the counter counteractions are, or the interactions are with other drugs. Like there's a lot to learn about pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have our pharmacists that help us. And, and that's what you learn to do. So when you arrive then on the scene of a birth and you're trained to do pharmaceuticals, or if you're a surgeon, like an OBGYN, you're trained to do surgery, this whole, like, get out of the way, don't use those skills notion is really, really hard. And of course, when you start Im implementing any interventions and you disrupt the the life cycle of birth just like if i went out into my garden and i added a whole bunch of artificial fertilizer i'm going to have other things i have to contend with you know maybe i put roundup on there and i kill some at the you know in order to save whatever plant i've got roundup of course is this glyphosate ridden junk that monsanto released to the world and now it's never going to be able to we're never going to get it off of our food system but right. Now that I've got that on there, what is the consequence of having done that? Well, the food's not going to be as nutritional or it's going to cause a poisonous something to go into my belly. And now I have to deal with the dysbiosis in my intestines. It's this, this constant trying to intervene and outsmart nature that leads us to these problematic things. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, if I have to whip out a scalpel and do a, a C-section urgently, thank God we're there. Yes. Yeah. But if you're compelled to intervene, you have to be also willing to intervene based on the consequences of those interventions. Mm -hmm. And naturally what happens is you end up being rushed to the operating room and somebody like me runs in with a scalpel and I save the day. And then I'm hailed as the king and the the like like how the hero, like what what a what an, an outstanding surgeon. But I wouldn't even have had to pull out the scalpel had I just sat back and let birth unfold. 85% mm -hmm. of the time. That's what that number actually means whenever right. I which you cited earlier. Right. And um so c-section rates they're going up so how do you feel about that <laughs> like um should yeah. we be having as many c-sections as we're having like i mean sure when when you need a c-section it's an emergency right you need to have yeah. a c-section is that right it should be yeah it should be so there are a couple non-emergent reasons to have a c-section and one of the uh the most important is if you have a placenta growing over the cervix, the baby can't come through. You've got the baby's life source there covering the opening of the pelvis. The cervix is is nothing. The cervix doesn't really matter. But the cervix is also, it, it's just a marker. It's a surrogate marker for where is the baby going to be heading whenever it goes into the pelvis. If the baby has to go through its, its oxygen line, right? That's not a great a great way for the baby to go through. But the the occurrence of a true placenta previa, which is what I'm describing, is way less than our, our, our national average. So where are all the other C-sections coming from? It's almost always due to a couple things, which do lead to an emergency. emergency. But is it really an emergency? So, so if we draw into question like this notion of an emergency C-section, the the, the very fastest I was able to get a baby out from the time we got a woman into the operating room to the time we had a baby out was 27 seconds. That is really fast. And now, and, and I'm not, I'm not alone. I'm not like a super surgeon. I mean, this is what we can do. We are very, very capable of that. And in that case, the baby's heart rate was down in like the sixties, which is way below where it should be. And this woman was bleeding out heavily from her from her vagina when she came in. So we called it immediately. We got the baby out. Mom and baby did just fine. The majority of C-sections, though, are probably completely unnecessary and they're definitely not emergent. So mm -hmm. things like a baby who's butt down because we aren't training doctors and midwives in order to help facilitate that if a baby were to get caught with like an arm around the neck or something. It's rare, but when it happens, we don't know how to manage it. So forget about vaginal breach birth, just go to the operating room. Twins um, 
we'll just start with twins. Triplets is a little bit more controversial, but triplets are pretty rare. Twin babies, got to have that, got to have that C-section. So twins uh, have to be delivered by C-section. That's, that's what's going to be said to you by almost every OB out there. Um, it's just too risky. We don't know what's going to happen. It's too risky. Well, we have lots of twins and there was actually two sets of triplets over the past year or two delivered in this part of the country mm -hmm. by a great midwife named Christine Laria. Triplets at home. Not even in a hospital, at home. So it is possible, but we have to 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 um, uh, prepare. We have to we have to train our doctors and other birth workers in order to mm -hmm. do this if we expect them to offer it. The um, probably the so so then if you have a C section, probably the third big reason is that you have a repeat C section because there's this dreaded risk of the uterus rupturing, which mm -hmm. happens so infrequently. I've maybe seen one or two like real ruptures in my life. Um, so that's the other thing. And then the fourth, which is the biggest one, um, Jacqueline Wolf goes into this in her book. It's called, um, cesarean section, an American rite of passage or something like that. She gets into the role of the introduction of that continuous fetal heart rate monitoring that every single woman has on their belly mm -hmm. that's monitoring the baby's heart rate and how that has led not to what it was intended to, which was a lower risk, a lower rate of cerebral palsy, but has led to a skyrocketing of C-sections. Because every time we see something look a little funny there, we rush to the operating room. And most of the time, the babies are just fine. But because we have never validated that system as a means of decreasing uh, neonatal morbidity and mortality, mm -hmm. and it hasn't, it hasn't done anything for that. Um, and, and every doctor will disagree as to which one needs to go to the OR and which one doesn't. We end up using that technology as a means of of, of justifying way too many C-sections. So this notion of my, my C-section was an emergency is something we say in order to make a person feel like they did the right thing, but you probably didn't need that C-section. And that's the, the saddest part about these rising C-section rates because no doctor is admitting, well, there's a lot of unnecessary C-sections. It's, it's mm -hmm. me, guys. It's me. I'll stop doing those. Like, no, you. everybody thinks that they're doing mm -hmm. the right C-sections, but mm -hmm. the data doesn't lie. And there's that lack of trust that you spoke about when people come to you because they feel like something wasn't right. Um, that's what you're referring to, like an example I can imagine. But Nathan, yeah. what what is wrong with a C-section though? So if a woman, I mean, some, some women get them done uh, by choice and they're like, no, I just want a C-section. So, I mean, what is the problem? Right. So let's talk about the C-section. So the first thing is that most women are still pretty uncomfortable during a C-section, right? It's not it's not a baby, you know, being born from the chrysalis. It's a baby being removed um, dis, very dystopically from a, an incision in the abdomen. In the United mm -hmm. States, it's around 37%, I think, nationally on average, meaning some areas have higher. Some areas like California have lower C-section rates. At my hospital, it was right around that average because we had a very high-risk referral center. Mm -hmm. um, so that number should sound dystopic to people. And the reason it should sound dystopic is most women who have C-sections are not going to be able to have the full experience of having a baby in the way that a, a woman who has a vaginal birth. It doesn't mean that you should feel bad about having had a C-section and some people elect to have it. If that's what you choose to do and you understand yeah. the risks and benefits, absolutely, I'm happy yeah. to do that for you. But a lot of women are sort of compelled to do that. And as a consequence, they feel like they were almost robbed of the birth experience, which is a rite of passage. I mean, it really is a tremendously transformative experience for so many women. And I know that only because I've heard them say that after they have a, a vaginal birth, the contrast between that and what they thought was a really beautiful birth in their C-section is like night and day. Mm -hmm. They're like, I didn't realize how much resentment I was carrying until I had my vaginal birth. So, mm -hmm. so of course- going through the c-section you have to be aware that this predisposes you in future pregnancies to have some issues you have now a a, a uterus that has been incised so tamara if you held out both of your arms and i and, and we did a strength test on your biceps and i cut through your left bicep and then we let it heal mm -hmm. you're not going to have the same strength in the left versus the right which is left intact it's just the nature of our musculoskeletal physiology so mm -hmm. you've got a uterus now that's a little bit weaker it may not be able to contract in the same way to deliver a baby vaginally. Not always. In fact, many women do have a successful vaginal birth after C-section. But, but even more importantly, that incision 
may be seen as so high risk that your midwife or doctor locally is not going to allow you. That word allow doesn't really belong in our vernacular, but that's what they'll say. We don't permit a vaginal birth after C-section here. And that, that incision, if the placenta were to form sort of on the lower side of the uterus and not at the top or not on the back, it can actually grow into the wall of the uterus through that incision, which is scar tissue. And when that happens, it's almost a guarantee that you're going to get a hysterectomy after that birth. So we might be impacting your future pregnancies way beyond just this conversation around uterine rupture. The other big thing, of course, is that when you have a C-section, one of the metrics that's hard to measure is what is it like for the woman bonding with her baby when she didn't actually push the baby out? In fact, she was anesthetized below her rib cage mm -hmm. and just felt some tugging and, and pushing. And the doctors are talking about their kids' sports games and who knows what else is going on in the room. It's not a sacred experience anymore. Now it's a surgery. Mm -hmm. And this baby is removed, the baby's taken away, and maybe in a few minutes, maybe five, 10 minutes, it probably seems like an eternity for the woman who's strapped down crucifixion style with a blue curtain in front of her face, and she's hyperventilating because she's so anxious. The baby then is eventually brought to your chest. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of women who feel very disconnected from their babies. Not everybody. I'm not- My friend did. You're describing her story exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it's it's almost like you, you, you like- went into like a coma for a second and then you come mm. out and there's a baby there, which yeah. if you're, you're general anesthesia, that's exactly what it feels like. So mm. there's a myriad of reasons and I'm not going to get into the data around breastfeeding and everything. Everything is harder after a C-section from getting up and moving to moving your bowels mm -hmm. to holding your baby because there is a lot of pain. We did just operate on your, on your insides. So, um, so there's a lot of reasons, I think, yeah. for people to consider why this trend in C-section is so um, is so difficult. And and even if you we just want, we just um, grew some butterflies or whatever, we had little caterpillars and they formed little cocoons and then we released the butterflies. Those mm -hmm. butterflies, my my little daughter was trying to open up the chrysalis, you know, like and I was like, honey, no, 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 you can't do that. That's a part of the the thing here. That that butterfly is getting stressed out as a as a consequence of having to break out of this little cocoon. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of actually making for the butterfly to be healthy enough to fly away. And there's no difference there with our little kids. I mean, and then of course we could get into not being pop, you know, colonized by the vaginal microbiome. I mean, there's so many, so many issues, avenues. so yeah. many avenues we could take yeah. there. Why are doctors so compelled to induce and to deliver early and to do cesareans and all of these interventions, 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 what is compelling them to do it is it just what they were taught what is going on there <clears throat> well you know it, as they always say a fish doesn't see water and like you said if you're trained to do that and you get really good at doing that then you like using that tool mm. because this the, so the com first compelling factor is the culture in which you were brought up as a doctor or a midwife or whatever the second thing is that there is um a tendency for us to intervene because we think that those interventions, which we're not going to be sued for doing the intervention, like you don't get sued, as they say, for the C-section you did, you get sued for the C-section you didn't. So there is some medical legal stuff there right. that's really compelling. Yeah. In, in other words, if a baby ends up having cerebral palsy, which is basically a consequence of an anoxic brain injury, yeah. and you didn't do a C-section, they might, you might get sued. In fact, that's probably the primary reason doctors, OBGYNs have such high malpractice. It's probably the highest malpractice of all specialties. Because you can be sued up until that kid is 18. Oh my gosh, and wow. they say, well, you know, he's slow in school. I wonder if it's related to a birth injury. Well, did your, you know, you still with the, I don't know the, the, like the rules are how long after the birth you can actually sue. But there's a lot of uh, precedence for doctors being held accountable for- We should say it's fear-based. A lot of what they do is just very like, fear oh, I've got to do this. Otherwise, you know, yeah. I might get in trouble for something right. if something goes wrong. Right. Right, exactly. So that's the second reason. And then the third is the more controversial thing. Do doctors get paid more to do C-sections okay. versus vaginal births? The f this is a super complicated question. A lot of right. people would say, of course they do, because it's a major surgery, but it's also a huge cost to the hospital mm -hmm. to run an operating room with the extra staff, the nurses, the anesthesiologists, everybody has to get paid there. Mm -hmm. So if a C-section is twice the reimbursement for a vaginal birth, I don't think the doctor is necessarily getting that. But what I do know is that maternity units in the United States tend to make a lot of hospitals uh, a lot of money. And it's so it's sort of like 
it's sort of like anywhere else. They want to advertise that they have a really good maternity unit because they want you to give birth there because they can get reimbursed from your insurance company or the government for more mm -hmm. money than, uh, you know, a person going into gets, uh, I don't know, an IV drip, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a super complicated conversation. I'm trying to unpack it now, doing some investigative work myself to try to figure out how doctors and hospitals and how this whole thing works from a compensation yeah. standpoint. But the bottom line is that a large maternity unit that can get people in and out more quickly is going to make more money for the hospital at large. And they want to make sure that that system is, is as smooth as possible. So mm -hmm. allowing, there is that word again, allowing a woman to be in labor for three days is not acceptable. Like we mm. want to get you in and out. We need that bed for somebody else because we want to charge the insurance companies another $15,000. And so that might it's be why they want to rush right. things along. Like there's that layer as well. Right. So much so that when your shift ends as a doctor, you're so tired at 6.30, your new doctor's coming on at seven or eight, let's say. And you know that there's this lady who's just been at six centimeters and then seven centimeters and eight centimeters. And she's just dragging along, Right. You're tired. Your nervous system is shot. You have to go home and take care of your own family. The doctor is going to come on fresh and say, why didn't you do a section? And you don't want to be seen as like lazy. That's actually how the culture of OBG treats you. It's like, why didn't you do the section? It's like, oh, I just, I think she can have a vaginal birth. Well, it seems like you just dumped that one on me. Fine. I'll do the section. I feel like you've been through this yourself. Oh my that God. Over like... and over. <laughs> over and over. So I would end up. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a pretty outspoken person. I didn't have all the neck and chest tattoos, but like I'm a fairly like competent guy. I've got kind of broader shoulders. I'm a I'm a white straight male. Like I get what I want. Mm -hmm. And I would and I would have to puff my chest out so that I didn't feel like they were, you know, um see me as lesser, right? Like I didn't want to lose their respect, but also like we're here to serve this person and they didn't consent to C-section and they can probably have a vaginal birth. We need to get our shit together so we can be a little bit more patient. But that's a that's a lot to put on a doctor who's been working 12 mm -hmm. hours. They haven't slept. Everybody knows that they're just, they're sitting on these. And then the unfortunate part is I can stay there for an extra three, six, eight hours until she gives birth. Or this doctor who's not like me is going to walk in immediately and say, oh, you know what? You haven't been progressing. I think we should do a C-section. And that woman's tired. Yeah. And so she's, she's been like, a okay. yeah, yeah, right. And and like women, of course, in our country have, have had to fawn and compromise and appease authority figures, including mm -hmm. just men in general, in order to survive throughout their entire adolescent and 20s, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're tired. They haven't slept. They're just like, we just, I just want to have this baby. I mean, I, I get it. And the doctor's saying, hey, yeah. you know what? You've been trying really. I think we tried everything. Why don't we do a C-section? And they're like, okay. And then later they feel bad. Yeah. yeah. But nobody really put them in the center. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of re the reason I left is at home, I'm on your turf. Like you tell me what to do. The it doesn't make it's different, right? They shift. Totally. Suddenly yeah. you're like, I'll do anything you want. Like this is your home. Right. It's yeah. your home. I don't wear my muddy shoes and put them up on your sofa just because I'm the doctor. I'm like mm. here in your home. Whereas in the hospital, there's this implication that you're here on my turf and I'm going to do what I mm. want. And I'm going to do it this way because I don't want the doctors to think I'm lazy. The other doctors, That's right? Interesting. Like, I don't know why that interests me so much. Just the dynamics between the doctors as well, like just the relationships there. And, and if if you're not done by the end of your shift, that you might face some criticism from the next one that's coming on shift. I just, I didn't even think of it that way. And it, it really, it really shows how being in a hospital can be, it just takes away that beautiful experience from the mother because she can probably sense all of that as well as she's, you know, going through this. So what, what is the experience like at home? Like, how is it different from a hospital birth? Oh, I just want everybody who's listening to or watching, I don't know if this is video, but mm -hmm. um, you can do it this is, too. Yeah. At, at some point, if you just close your eyes over like a cup of coffee and just imagine what what is the environment like where you're giving birth? What is it, mm -hmm. the room smell like? What are the lights? Are they dim? Are they bright? Are you outside? Are you inside? <clears throat> who's talking to you? How are they speaking to you? Is anybody talking at all? Like when you try to dream this up, what comes to mind? And most people what they will write down, I have the, them do this exercise, is ex 
is, is, is an environment that's very hard to mimic in the hospital, let's just say. It's not a guarantee that you can get it at home, but it's more likely that you're going to be able to have the ambiance um, welcoming a, a, a baby for the first moments of their life into a warm home environment where you might even be on your bed. You may have conceived your baby on the bed. You're giving birth on the bed. That was the case for my wife and I in our second, which was at home. And you just lay there and you you sit with your baby. It's really, really interesting. So the reason that the environment matters is that the baby's nervous system isn't even fully developed. The baby's going to rely on mom and dad, specifically mom, also dad, in order to help make them feel safe once they emerge. If they don't feel safe when they emerge, then their nervous system never actually equilibrates to safety in the world. It actually equilibrates to there's a threat going around, you know, around every corner. This is really drawing heavily from what's called polyvagal theory, which I won't get into. But basically, if you feel safe, your body operates well. If you don't feel safe and you live your life thinking the world is out to get you, your, your physiology is going to change in that regard as well. But a little baby through co-regulation with mom, breathing with mom, like being right on her heart to be able to hear her aorta, which it, the baby's been hearing for nine and a half months, like that. They can now be on your chest and they they'll, their breathing patterns and their heart rate will start regulating with yours. Add to that, like, oh, look at the little fingers. Oh, little honey, you smell so good. Oh, you're finally here. Like all of that. They're hearing your voices and they're realizing this is a safe place and these are people here to keep me safe. That is actually physiologically important for the child. And when you contrast that with what happens in the hospital, most of the time, we had a great hospital birth at Norton here in Louisville, awesome hospital experience. But that's not always the case, especially when we think about 37% of babies coming out in a brightly lit OR that is filled with a cacophony of scary noises, even for adults, let alone yeah. a new baby. Yeah. So a lot of the practices we do in the hospital, you as the birthing family can advocate to not have those things. But if you don't advocate, we're going to put eye goop on the baby. We're going to take the baby and dry the baby off and weigh the baby and wrap the baby up into this little cocoon, as opposed to letting the baby's skin touch your skin. We're going to shoot some, some uh, medicine in the foot with a sharp needle. We're going to do all of these things before you even get to hold your baby. And that is telling the baby from day moment one of life outside of the uterus that this is not safe and it doesn't help the baby co-regulate. So um, again, it's to each their own. Home birth is not for everybody, but when you choose a home birth, your baby will likely have, and we have data now to support this, will likely have a much healthier life going forward as a consequence of how they were born, which is why it does matter how babies are brought into the world. It's just something that comes to mind. The only thing, the thing that scares me the most about home birth is the pain. <clears throat> so I had um, an epidural with both of mine. Um, the first was because I just lit, I could not take it. And the second, I was just, I just jumped straight in there. Like I just wanted it because um, just the pain was so much. How, how um, do you deal with that? So someone in your position, someone who is in so much pain and they just can't take it. Like, how do you get someone through that? Because that's what would happen with me in a home birth. Like I, I could not take it. I it was too much. And that's the only thing that would stop me from doing a home birth. So I can imagine other women are the same. So what would you what would you say to those types who are like, I, I can't do without an epidural? I think the primary thing, the primary exercise that I like to walk people through, especially for the guys, you know, like mm -hmm. let's say that that, you know, a woman with the baby inside of her is like, I'm into the home birth. And the dad's like, no, 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 we can't do that. It's too unsafe. Mm. The safety thing is actually, I think, the most important piece. And, it you know, is, we can yeah. talk about meditation and guided, you know, exercises and all of this. We can I talk tried about that in my first, did not work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, this is the, this is the cornerstone of hypnobirthing, but usually mm, right. uh, it doesn't always work because there's still a story that you're bringing into the childbirth experience. So what I'll especially find is effective for the men, but women can get some from, something from this as well. Because because frankly, most women who come to me are already like, I'm, I'm in, let's home birth, baby. So I don't like to, con I, I don't I'm really not good at motivating or convincing people otherwise. I just want people to have all of the insights. And if we want to go deeper, we can, um, or the pros and cons, I should say. Um, but if you go to your mother 
whether you're a man or a woman, go to your mother and ask them to tell your birth story. What you'll find is that subconsciously you've probably developed uh, this notion that when you were born, you you inflict a lot of pain and suffering on your mother. And I'm not like a Sigmund Freud guy junkie, but this was one thing taking away, taken away um, from Freudian psychology that your mother was is one of the more important women, if not the most important woman you're ever going to encounter, especially for us young men. And the story you were told around the dinner table and to friends and family when you were just a baby, like you didn't even have a full conscious awareness of the world was that you inflicted all this pain and suffering, not on just your mother, but also on the relationship. You know, we stopped having sex. I didn't like my body. I, um, it was so painful. I needed the epidural. I needed a second epidural. Uh, in, in my own birth story, you know, Nathan split me from front to back. So when you think about subconsciously, it's not just me, the media, but it's also the stories that we've heard as young people have imbued us with this notion that there is nothing safe about this. And if you don't feel mm -hmm. safe again, the pain threshold is going to go way down right. and everything is just going to be amplified because yeah. you're being, you've been told that you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And if you don't die, it's going to feel like you're going to die. And uh, you know, you're, your old identity is dying and you're, you're being reborn. So in that regard, it's not very safe, but the physical part of this is actually quite safe, you know, mm -hmm. even in countries without a lot of resources, but that doesn't matter to your nervous system. Your nervous system has already been imprinted with this notion that you're going to be in horrible pain. It's going to be the worst thing ever. Every time I've ever seen this in a movie, it's a woman screaming bloody murder to push yeah. her baby out. And, and so you had to bring that Tamara into your birth. Yeah. So the unpacking of that, first helping your mom retell the birth story. Mom, what was it like when you held me for the first time? Suddenly then you see a shift and they're like, oh, it was so precious. You were such a cute little naked piglet and you smelled so wonderful and you had these little fingernails. I remember you were, you were, you were playing with my hair, with your hand, like whatever. They go into that space of all of the positives, but the positives aren't the things that we often talk about. It's those, it's those painful times that we like to share. So get your birth story and help your mom retell it and then write it down. And that becomes your mantra. That could all that could actually be a part of your birth plan. Mm -hmm. And when you start with that, when you get the glimmer in your eye, go hear your birth story. When you start with that, everything that you learn through my programs and you get the, a new view on what you're seeing on Instagram, nobody has any idea because it's mm -hmm. gonna be your experience. But if you can start with a story that is not around pain and suffering, but actually around joy, exaltation, maybe ecstasy, maybe orgasm, like there's terms like that, mm -hmm. that can become a part of your experience. And then of course, working with, you know, me and Sarah and our program or whatever, we work on mindset a lot. We try to help women and, and their partners feel empowered in this process, as opposed to, you know, this is a consequence of having unprotected sex and, and you're going to pay for that now, you know, Eve's original mm -hmm. sin, you're going to have all this pain. It doesn't have to be like that. We can work through that with time, but it does take quite a bit of preparation that in hindsight makes sense, mm -hmm. but you don't sometimes know what you don't know until you're there. I love how much you go into everything. Like you even go into the birth story of the actual mother and how what she went through. I just think there's so much to what you offer. Um, and it's funny when you say, you know, your mindset going into it, because, you know, I had friends and who had kids before me before I ever had my first and they were like it was the closest I've ever come to death and it was just like oh yeah. and yeah. so maybe like subconsciously I did go in there with a lot of fear and for my second definitely because my first it was so painful for me like my second I was just like I was very fearful and it's, it's really strange for my second I was all, I had needles in me and I was kind of, and I felt really tense. I was just like this for like literally hours. I just, I don't know why. I just, my body couldn't relax. So it, my second birth was a weird one, I guess, in that sense. But um, I really love that um, you come from all these different angles to help the the women that you, that you um, help to deliver their babies. You know, women who don't have epidurals tend to not also not have tearing. So uh, I had terrible tearing in my first. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so here's the secret there is that mm. moving throughout the whole labor process um, ultimately results in the baby going through this corkscrew pattern to get out of the pelvis, which is very mobile. 
Um, and we'll talk about that because we should talk about some nutrition stuff too. Yeah. Um, when a woman is active, they're well nourished, their body is supple, they open up and they close their perineum stretches and it relaxes and you don't have the tearing and everything else. So if you contrast the experience of being in the hospital, you're in, you have an epidural, you're on your back, your knees are pulled all the way up. Yeah. That doesn't have to be the birth experience, but that ultimately will make it a lot harder and you will feel like something happening to you as opposed to you being a part of the experience. Yeah. So again, I don't want to dissuade people from getting regional anesthesia. Sometimes it is really, really helpful for even relaxing the body, especially when you're in the state of fear. But I, since attending home births, and I do about one a month, I haven't placed a single suture in anybody's vagina or perineum. Wow. And I used to do it every single time in the hospital. That's crazy. Wow. So yeah. And then, yeah. And then, and then of course, if you are mobile, there are different positions that will actually help facilitate birth, squatting, sideline position, runner's lunge. Those are all actually very helpful. But in a hospital, you're relegated to the bed on your yeah. back. And because epidural, obviously, you can't move. Yeah, you can't you move. In your arm. So like, I yeah. mean, you're kind of stuck. Um, and actually, with my first, um, I had the epidural and then my contraction slowed down. So it took more hours than it probably would have taken if I didn't have the epidural. So that was Maybe. the first thing. Um, that was yeah. the first issue. And the next issue is I, I had to get the baby out ASAP because apparently the baby had the cord wrapped around um, their neck. So um, I was told I need to get this baby out now. Otherwise, I'm going to have a C-section. So I had this kind of ultimatum in my head and I knew I didn't want a C-section. I was just like, oh my God, I've got to get this, this baby out. So I literally in one push, I went and I came out and I tore so badly. And I think mm. it was my perineum that tore yeah. and um, obviously a lot of bleeding. And you know, I haven't been the same since I haven't yeah. like it, like literally my postures changed the way I walk changed because that like fundamentally my core yeah. like has been fundamentally disrupted it really disrupts everything and um yeah and I, I guess that's something I have to live with now you know mm. and and now hearing you say that not having an epidural possibly <laughs> all of that stuff that cascade that we talk about probably didn't even need to happen like that's that's crazy like that's enough to make someone think okay maybe this home birth thing there's something to it I just have one more question um about the postnatal advice and care because um I was speaking to Lily Nichols and she basically we we're talking she's fab and um she's all about prenatal um and then obviously postnatal nutrition and lifestyle and um we we're talking about postpartum because I think a lot of women are just kind of dropped after they give birth and it's all about the baby it's not about the mother anymore and um, I believe it was Oscar Seralach. I don't know how to pronounce his second name, um, but Dr. Oscar Seralach, he, um, uh, the postpartum depletion book, he said it takes a woman about two to five years to replenish the nutrients that she lost oh, yeah. from the entire birthing process. So I just wondered your take on um, postpartum advice and care. Is it up to scratch? And if not, how would you advise differently for someone who's had children? I mean, it's a big topic, but. Well, first and foremost, you know, the postpartum period is for nearly every family in the United States is you leave the hospital or you're at home or whatever, and then you're alone. And mm -hmm. there's a meal train where people are bringing you casseroles that you're kind of tired of eating. They may not even be all that nourishing, but mm -hmm. they're bringing it to you because they want to do something kind. And you're largely alone. And you've got this little baby that for the first two weeks seems easy. And then yeah. six weeks rolls around and suddenly you're in like, you're in it, you're in the trenches. So all of that is to say that this isolation period after having a baby is probably not optimal. Let's just say that. I, I don't know. I mean, it certainly feels very, very isolating and, and solitary. Um, and then of course, most men get six weeks of paternity leave if they get any and then they're back to work, right? So mom is alone with this little baby, has no time to herself, has no, so you're being woken up at all times of the night. It's it's exhausting. So getting our uh, 
priority straight is the society whereby each person, this is borrowing from Rochelle Garcia Saliga a little bit at Innate Traditions. If you don't know her, she's a, a really, really great resource, but she had um, advised, you know, recommending that each, the mother and the father both have two separate support people. And the husband is normally relying on his wife for some support, but they can't be your support person because they're taking care of the baby now. Um, so finding two separate people in your circle that can be your like ride or die go to mm -hmm. support people is really, really critical. Ideally, the whole community would would rally around every woman giving birth, but we're so far from that. Yeah. 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 I'm not even going to say we need to do that. That just sounds like <laughs> some political pundit, you know, dreaming big. And so that's the ideal. We're not there, of course. From a caring for yourself standpoint, the women who give birth with me and who are in my communities, like the Born Free Method, they're so nourished physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually by the time they give birth that they almost have an easy transition. It's like they were ready for it. But mm -hmm. the, the kicker is that we're not even eating nutritious foods since you brought up Lily Nichols, let alone getting our mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being under control before you go through a rapid spiritual transformation from maiden to mother. Mm -hmm. The father's clueless, the mom's clueless. We've got all these great websites and gift boxes and all that, but that actually doesn't cut it for a yeah. rite of passage. So without, I really, we really don't have time to go into all of the lifestyle stuff, but the two things I would emphasize are the most important is adequate sleep which is also going to help impact how your gut is functioning from a digestion and absorption standpoint, because we know that chronic stress leads to all sorts of gut issues. And that leads to all these mood disorders and nutritional deficiencies and all of that. But when you're sleeping well, you also are getting your reserves up. You're actually able to heal and restore your body, not let alone the anabolic process of building a baby in a placenta. It's all going to be smoother if you're prioritizing sleep and not staying up extra late every night in your third trimester, looking at TikTok or whatever people do. Um, from a nutritional standpoint, I will summarize, I'll just simplify this. Five multivitamins, Lily Nichols would absolutely agree yeah. with this, um, except she might, she might you know, replace one or two of these foods. But the ones that I recommend are organ meats, specifically beef liver, but heart, spleen, kidneys, get it all. Mm. Eat as many organ meats as possible. There's a new uh, nose to tail protein um, supplement company, like a protein for your post-workouts, but it has organ meats in it. It's called Noble Origins. Mm. Uh, they have some additional yeah, dried awesome. organ meats. It's amazing. Mm. Add that to your post-workout shakes or just have a shake every day. Get the organ meats in. You can get the desiccated capsules. You can get it from your local butcher. It's the cheapest part of the cow because we have this intolerance to or an impalatability with uh with liver but there's so much nutrition in that and then if you add in eggs bone broth ideally homemade or farm fresh eggs um uh, a really really good cod liver oil and um smoked oysters that's kind of the surprise but there's so many additional nutrients like taurine and some other things in smoked oysters mm. um you don't have to worry about getting you know, food poisoning. We're not talking about raw oysters, although if you wanted to and you were happy with the source, you know, be my guest. But eating those five foods is going to give you so many amino acids, a full complement of different fatty acids, and most notably, all these omega-3s they are going to help build your baby's brain and nervous system. Um, the micronutrients, the vitamins like choline, which is one of the B vitamins, methylfolate from the liver, you're getting everything in the full package and it's coming in the whole food form. If you can get as many of those foods, even if it's just the beef liver and smoked oysters, let's say, preconception all the way through postpartum is going to be so great without even getting a prenatal. I do recommend people take a prenatal, mostly because it would be heresy not to, but my wife and I didn't use one. Okay. Um, we, we Natal is the brand that I'm most in alignment with. I think they just do an awesome job, three capsules a day as an insurance policy on top of an already healthy lifestyle. And um, what I find is that when people eat these foods, not only does their risk of gestational diabetes and preeclampsia and these things just drop through the floor, and it's no guarantee, but I haven't had yet a person develop those conditions on my regimen. Mm. <laughs> um, of course, we get beyond sleep and nutrition, but still just those two things, I think will get you 80% of the way there. Um, but also their perineums are healthier. Their, their, their pelvises are more mobile. 
their placentas are these big chunky Giants. placentas. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're obviously well nourished, <laughs> you know, and the women don't end up developing blood sugar issues. They mm. end up going back to their, you know, you're never going to go back to your pre-pregnancy body. Thank God. Cause now you're a mom, like you mm. have different priorities in the world and you have different, a different sex appeal altogether. That's a different topic for a different time. But the, this, this notion that like we, I, you know, um, I'm worried about gaining weight and whatnot, your body's not going to do that if you're nourishing yourself with the right foods. And so, um, I don't even take vegan clients in my, in my practice. I just don't accept you. Like I, I won't attend your birth because your placentas fall apart, like tissue paper, your yes. perineum shred like diabetics and smokers, like very, very, very bad to be vegan in pregnancy, unless you're very, very, very specific with where you're getting your omega threes and you're replacing these nutrients in other ways. Um, but that's, that's, that's what I think we can do in order to also support the postpartum experience because your reserves are so high that that depletion doesn't really quite happen. That depletion is a consequence of the standard American diet in the way that we value productivity over pregnenolone and all the other hormones that drive our bodies, um, yeah. before or after pregnancy. And it's crazy how much you can actually learn from just good nutrition because, you know, um, gestational diabetes, you know, people, if, if they knew that they just need to take sugar out of their diet and then it can just disappear. It's like, there's so much power in um, the knowledge of yeah. nutrition and how you can feed yourself and how, how instant it can be, the benefits. Um, yeah, totally. That is interesting. Mm. The, I mean, the <laughs> vegan story, my gosh. That's I've never heard. I've never heard that before. Yeah, I've maybe had like a dozen or two vegans in my in my care during the birth, and they're usually people. So I used to work as a hospitalist, meaning I would deal with all the emergencies that came in. And the number of, not every vegan, but the number of times a person said, "I am vegan," and then I looked at their placenta. I made a point to look at their placenta and also the tissue, the integrity of the tissue. Every single time they needed some sutures in the vagina. And remember what I just said, I've had women giving birth at home without all of the hosp fancy hospital stuff and having an in completely intact vagina and perineum um, at home. These women all needed multiple sutures in the vagina. And the issue with unhealthy tissue is that the suture, you have to be able to pull on the tissue to pull it together. The, t the sutures, the strings would just shear right through. So I, I know this is getting a little graphic, but the point here is that you don't have the best nourishment going towards your tissues that need to be expandable and flexible and be able to contract back down in a healthy way if you're not nourishing your body appropriately. Um, and then the placentas, you know, you can hold a placenta up and swing it around. It's like a piece of a liver, but the vegan placentas would just fall apart. So it wasn't a surprise that they came in and their baby's heart rate was going up and down and they maybe had an abruption, which is when you get bleeding behind the placenta prematurely. It's a not, it's not a causative thing. It is just a, an association that is pretty darn compelling. And it was sufficiently compelling for me to say, I can't accept you in the home environment with your, I usually take high risk clients at home with your medical history and the fact that you're vegan, like it's a ticking time bomb. And even me, the radical cowboy that I am, I think you'd be better off in the hospital just because I have seen, you know, some bad things happen. So, so the way around is you start eating beef liver and smoked oysters, like yeah. just for a period of time. And then we can go back to being vegan after, you know, maybe three to four months after. <laughs> I think having like a big chunky placenta, that's the goal, right? Because that's, yeah, that's a, big, a good sign. Word. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. exercise does that as well. Like exercise in totally. pregnancy. Because totally. It's all the totally. blood vessels and it's just very kind of- yeah, Like angiogenesis. Yeah. 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 So exercise is probably the best studied means of preventing pregnancy complications, even mm -hmm. more so than nutrition. So we haven't talked about that. But again, yeah. we did mention movement, adequately moving, staying active, building some muscle, Training as if you're going to go through this really hard experience actually has so many benefits beyond just, you know, preventing diastasis recti and, and having no, you know, less low back pain. It actually mm -hmm. also will support a healthy baby and placenta unit. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's also yeah. really critical. Yeah. 
Oh, well, that was a great conversation. And I could, I'd love to dive into the exercise thing, but I just think maybe, maybe another time. We'll talk maybe. about it another time. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, Nathan, that was so, that was so lovely. That was a great conversation. And I just, God, some of the facts that you've dropped are just like, whoa, I just, I need to think about that. Like I need to go away and just kind of, whoo, like some of the things you've said is quite mind blowing. Um, I mean, people know how to find you. You're out there. Um, you know, it's quite easy to find you. You've got podcasts and you're very active on social media and um, your website is so resourceful. But do you have any preferred places where people could find you? I think you could find most of who I am and what I'm about on um, on Instagram at Nathan Riley OB uh, the podcast is the Holistic OB Joanne podcast. If if the program I've been mentioning, Born Free, is of interest to people, we we get you in and, and cover everything from preconception through postpartum. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's a lot, but that's bornfreemethod.com. But really at um, Instagram or my website, Beloved Holistics, you can find everything mm -hmm. that I'm doing. And I always love hearing from people. So if you have any questions, they can reach out. I do that on a donation basis, cons consultation. So it's it's really easy to get in with me and and um, love to be of, of support to your audience if if they need me. Lovely. And it's a great podcast as well. I've listened to a oh, few you. episodes <laughs> and um, I listened to the recent one. Um, I've forgotten her name, but it was just really interesting. Like I learned that a lot one. about the politics, about um, oh, yeah. midwives and the licensing and everything. Yeah. I was like... Something. Yeah, there, yeah. This, the, the 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 healthcare economics, like economics of childbirth and the politics of childbirth in the United States between those two, you could have 100 years of reading and still not make sense of it. It is very, very complicated. And so mm -hmm. it's it's not just there's a bunch of bad doctors out there doing bad things. Yeah, it's right. it's a systemic issue. It is really, really complicated. So trying to gradually unpack that for people. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you so much. That was a fabulous conversation. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Tamara. Thank you.